Good morning. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning. Good morning, all of our listeners for the Money Advantage. This is the Money Advantage podcast, and we are coming to you live again with a new conversation about becoming your own banker. So we're continuing on in our series that we've been plugging along with. And this is the book that Nelson Nash wrote that really exposed this whole idea of how you can use specially designed whole life insurance that's high cash value, dividend paying whole life insurance for the purpose of becoming your own banker, taking over the banking function in your life and truly creating substantial wealth and having a pool of reserves that you can access and use on a regular basis. So um, Bruce, I'm really excited to continue on this conversation. First, we really kind of went through just the the main idea that banking is something that's necessary and it's one of the most important businesses in the world and we need to understand how it works. And then we really dug into um, using our imagination to think differently and what it would take to start a grocery store. We had the whole grocery store analogy. We talked about not stealing the peas. And then in part three, we talked about how the need for financing is greater than the need for savings and why so many people, so many Americans have dollars that are leaving their control due to interest because of financing. And we can recap any of those in any way that you'd like as well. And today we're really digging into this idea of what it would actually take to start an actual bank and what those laws of banking are. So if you are following along with us, we are in what I would consider chapter four. He didn't label the chapters with a number, but this is called, well, I need to pull it up, don't I? You probably have it in front of you. Creating your own banking system through dividend paying life insurance. Yes. Okay. So that is on page, we're starting on page 21. But Bruce, let's hear your thoughts before we dig into this particular chapter. Well, Nelson used to get very frustrated with uh, regulators uh, when he first started out because uh, it wasn't just the regulators um, in the insurance in- industry, but also banking regulators because they were saying, you can't call this a bank. Mm-hmm. And and in and, and his 10-hour talks that he used to do, he'd say, well, you know, when you're watching a river flow um, down, you're actually standing on a bank. He was also a pilot. And he said, you know, when you make a turn, you actually, it's called banking the airplane. Yeah, this, like, this flying yeah. sideways to turn, yes. And he said, you know, so the word bank should not uh, have some kind of special regulatory uh, position uh, because really it's a process of saving and lending. That's what banks do. They they take in people's deposits and then they lend out um, for an interest in that arbitrage between what they pay people to bring the money in and then what they lend out is the arbitrage and how they make money. And actually they can make a lot more money than that because in our current system, we have what's called fractional reserve banking so that you can actually make, you can actually just have 10% of the deposits in the bank. So maybe we want to talk a little bit about the history of how banking came about. Um, Banking came yeah, about because, yeah, because banking came about and actually currency came about out of a need because, you know, years and years ago, there was just the, a barter system. You know, people just, you know, if you had two goats and you wanted some grain, you would say, OK, I'll give you one goat for a, a wagon full of grain. And that was that system worked as best as it could for commerce. But the problem with that system was. If you didn't want a goat and you had grain, then you weren't going to be able to trade for that. Or I've got yeah. flour or I've got sugar and you have the grain, but I don't have any goats, then we need a different way to trade, right? Correct. And so, you know, there was a variety of systems, but, you know, precious metals came into being. I mean, there was all kinds of things. Uh, they use use grain or they also use uh, shells and all kinds of things. But it wasn't until precious metals such as silver and 
gold came about that people were actually had something that almost everybody wanted and it was scarce. Well, the problem was as you collected this and you had no protection for yourself or very little protection, as the great bank robber Willie Sutton said, when asked, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the cash is. Well, people would rob people of their silver and gold and they couldn't protect themselves. So these places, people would then say, bring your silver and gold to us. We will protect it. And they would write out little slips and say, okay, you have on deposit, you know, X amount of ounces of gold or silver. And they would give the people those slips and those are demand deposits. So they would bring the slips back to get all or a portion of their gold or silver. And the, the ironic thing about this is because it was a protectionary thing, you actually had to pay a portion of your gold or silver for that extra protection. But then what, what's, what they quickly realized was that, that people weren't coming back for their gold and silver. They were just storing it there. So they decided to, to well, what we could do is we could lend out gold and silver to people and we can make interest on that, that loan because people aren't coming back for this gold or silver. So that was the first part of fractional reserve banking. Cause then they quickly figured out that, well, their people are trading their deposit demand slips out in the public instead of their actual gold. So they'd say, look, I have a deposit slip here that says I have 10 ounces of gold in the bank. Instead of going to get the 10 ounces of gold and then give it to a person, they would just give them the deposit, the main deposit slips. And that was kind of the first currency. Mm-hmm. So here. Because it becomes this it, intermediary between the actual valuable substance. Right. And so they say, here, take this and you could always redeem it at the bank. <laughs> well, then the bank started figuring out we could do the same thing. We could just say, okay, we're not actually giving you the gold to lend out and you have to give us the gold back and interest. We're just going to write a a deposit slip and say, here, you can go use this because you have X amount that you're borrowing from the gold. And then that person could take it and they could say to, let's say they were um, going to construct a hotel in the Wild West and they could say, here's the lumber yard. Here's our demand deposit. So now that's how we're going to pay for it instead of bringing you actual gold and silver because you don't want to have this a lot of gold and silver with you right now either because it's kind of dangerous to have all this. People could rob you. So here's the demand deposit, and you could hide a demand deposit slip a lot easier than you could hide a bunch of gold and silver. That's the problem with gold and silver. It's so heavy to actually transport. Mm-hmm. And so then they would just take it as payment knowing that they could go to the bank at any time. Well, then the bank figured out, well, we're charging people to bring their gold and silver. So a lot of people may not be using that as a service. So why don't we attract more people to bring gold and silver by actually telling them, we'll pay you to bring their gold and silver. So they started paying interest Mm -hmm. because they can make a lot more to lend out. So that's kind of the history, a quick history lesson of, of banking. I so think that's this really per- helpful because it sets up the reason for this particular episode. So <clears throat> Nelson starts this chapter by saying, we're creating a bank like the ones you already know about. So what do we know about banks? Well, we know you have your paycheck automatically deposited into a bank. You probably have a debit card that you can access money that's in the bank and a credit card that you can access money against what you have in the bank and you have a line of credit you probably don't go into a bank very often to get cash anymore unless you have kids and you're using money for kids or a few cash transactions here and there. But we use the banking system, but we we have a lot of money flowing through that banking system. So we know that the banks are wealthy and we go to them to store capital and to get loans. That's our general experience. But he's going to take this whole conversation during this chapter into the rules of banking. And he actually ends up towards the end of the chapter. I'm going to kind of give a little spoiler alert. 
he says at the end, these are not man-made rules. They're God-made rules and you disobey them at your own peril. So he's saying, yes, there's a banking system, but it's not just make it up as you go, figure out what you want to do, loan out as much as you want, have as many deposits as you want. There are laws of nature that confine the parameters of prudent banking in order to have a banking system that lasts for a long time. So he's going to unpack those through the chapter, and we're going to talk about those today. But these are the principles that you need in your own family banking system, in your own infinite banking system, if you are going to operate in a way that is sustainable for the long term. So you want to be a good and honest banker truly by understanding those principles. And I think it's really helpful to hear the history of banking because you could say, well, they were just really innovative and they just kept making decisions and, you know, figuring out what was the easiest next thing to do to help people and to also be profitable. They did, but there's also rules that they had to follow. So I think, um, I feel like that's a really good segue into um, beginning the chapter. Does that work for you, Bruce? Yeah, absolutely. And um, the thing that Nelson used to hit home all the time, and I, and I, unfortunately, I think over the last 12 years or so, it's kind of lost its luster in a lot of people's eyes and may come back a little bit. And that is the fact that the first principle you need to understand is that you finance everything in your life. So a lot of people think, well, if I just pay cash for something, then I, I, I'm doing the greatest thing I could possibly do because I'm not incurring any interest on this cash uh, loan. And Nelson says, no, 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 no. You're always financing things. You're either giving up the interest you could have made on that cash or you're paying interest. So some would call this opportunity cost. This is a concept that is um, lost on a lot of people. Um, And I once had a client of mine say opportunity cost is like, you lose the opportunity to make money on your money and because you've put it somewhere else. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly right. So if you just think of opportunity costs as the op- you're losing the opportunity to make money on the money you use to purchase that, then that's a good way of thinking it. The second thing he talked about in this particular chapter is he point people, he's pointing people to an excellent article in the September of 1993 Fortune magazine entitled, the Real Key to Creating Wealth by Sean Tolley, in which he describes the concept of economic value add, or EVA, developed by Stern Stewart and Company of New York City. Tolley said, understanding that EVA is easily today's leading idea in corporate finance and one of the most talked about in business, it is far from, an, uh, far from the newest uh, concept. On the contrary, earning more than the cost of capital is about the Otis Idea Enterprise. So in other words, everybody is always looking for capital to start a business or an endeavor or so on and so forth. That cost of capital comes in a couple of different ways. It could be just the cost of your own personal labor. So you're, you're doing your own personal labor, you're trying hard, you're saving up money, so on and so forth. That is actually the cost of the capital in one. Another cost of capital is Somebody else sees that, oh, you are actually uh, have a lot of integrity, you have a lot of character, you have a lot of, of um, drive. And so I'm going to give you my capital that I derived from some resource if you give me something else, which will be the cost of how you develop your endeavor or your business. That's the cost of capital. Well, people are only going to do that if they can make more on their business or in the endeavor than what they actually have to pay for the capital. And that's what Nelson says, the oldest idea in in the enterprise of business around, because you would never, this is one of the problems in a lot of businesses. And and frankly, in in the United States and many countries around the world now, our cost of capital or our cost to borrow is going to actually be such a drag on the economy or on a particular business that you're never going to be profitable because you're continually having to pay the interest on it. And if you can't build the business up to make more than the interest, then there's no reason why you're ever going to be profitable. Mm -hmm. So EVA is a concept that everybody needs to understand. 
So Bruce, I <clears throat> did not remember those two concepts from the chapter that I read, and I think you were in the one ahead. So that's um, a sneak preview of the future chapter, which is also very awesome. And I think helpful for understanding. Um, we can cover both chapters if you want. I, I prepared on um, the one that started on page 21. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we covered that one yet, but we are, this is all valuable information for anyone who is. Well, they all kind of, yeah, they all kind of run together. As far they as absolutely do. And this is all extremely valuable information just for anyone who is wanting to manage and maintain your own strong, stable, fiscally responsible financial life. And so, um, Bruce, as he kind of starts here um, in the chapter, he he talks also about you need to have, he, he's going to work up to a prudent relationship between three different things, capital, deposits, and lending. So I'm going to um, just kind of unpack that a little bit. So he says, if you're going to start a bank, like the ones you already know about. So you're going to be starting a banking system where somehow you are going to need capital, you're going to have deposits, and you're going to have lending. So those are three components that make up this working relationship that needs to be in balance in a banking system. So in order to start, he said, just like the grocery business, that you would have to have all this upfront capital before you can be profitable. It's even higher in the banking industry. And so I'm just going to share a little bit from the book, but Bruce, I know you have experience with people who've actually started real banks as well. And I'd like yes. to share that in just a second. So <clears throat> he's, he says, first, you're going to have to go get some capital. It's going to be probably more like in the order of 5 million um, or more. And that's going to have to sit somewhere, which where are you going to set this money in a liquid form, probably in another bank somewhere. So you're storing up this capital over time and you're putting this capital before you can even start your banking business in a bank somewhere. And that's sitting, probably getting a really low interest rate. And then you're going to have to apply to the banking commissioner's office. Once you have the capital to begin, you're going to have to apply for a bank charter. And that's going to take some time. And he says, probably going to be about another, I think he even said 10 years, but your chance of getting, um, <clears throat> Uh, bank charter at this point is probably less than 100 to 1. He's saying the odds are really low that you're even going to get a charter to begin to open your bank. So he said there's a lot that's happening here. Many years are probably going to pass that you are going to wait on this charter to be able to open your bank. And then in the meantime, you're still going to have to get a good location and put up a building. So you need the capital, then you need the bank charter, a lot of capital, a lot of time. And then you still have more capital expenditure that you're going to need in order to be able to open your bank. And then once you open the bank, you can't just say, well, we're open for business and be able to extend loans and be profitable right away. You're first going to have to attract depositors to put their money in, just like you were talking about with the, the history of banking. You're going to have to pay them an interest rate, probably better than the bank next door, to get them to move their money from a bank that they're already using to your bank. And that's also going to be an additional cost to you. Meanwhile, you're getting some deposits. And when you finally are ready, now you're ready to be able to make loans and get into the business of banking. That's a really long process. Bruce, can you explain from your perspective and from your experience um, what you've heard that it, that it actually takes to start a bank? Yeah, actually, I have a very good friend who had a mortgage business or has a mortgage business. And um, he was capped of how many federally insured loans he could make from Freddie Mae. And the reason he was capped was, was the federal regulations said that you had to be doing uh, more business in um, lower income or areas. You had to be all for offering this. Mm. And, and the way... I don't. I didn't understand the entire uh, reason for this, but you had to have a brick and mortar place in that uh, particular thing, and the only way that he could go outside of the the Missouri state of Missouri and go to and offer his services in other states is if he actually had a bank of a physical location, huh. and once you had a physical location of a bank then you could actually get um, mortgage um, certification in every state. Oh, and so, wow. So that yeah. sounds like an even longer process to get the bank, then the mortgage certification. 
Correct. So what was interesting is the numbers were almost identical to what Nelson talks about. Oh. Um, so he went out to his friends, families, anybody who wanted to invest it, and he raised $20 million. And this process took about 10 years. Oh, wow. And the, re- <clears throat> the reason I know that is because one of, the, one of my clients actually invested in this. And we talked about, you know, how he has a certain amount of money tied up to the, in this bank. And, the, and then the bank opened after about 10 years. So it, it's amazing how it was almost like Nelson, you know, hit it almost directly from my experience of what was going on. That's crazy that <clears throat> yet it's very profitable to be in banking. So it's profitable to go through that pain of building up the capital and the time in order to be able to get into and have the um, the access point, almost like the uh, prerequisite to be able to benefit from the profitability of banking. So, <clears throat> well, if well, Rachel, if we talk about, you know, kind of Nelson's premise of don't be afraid to capitalize and think long-term, those are the two things that you really need to think about when you're doing an infinite banking type process. And I tell people all this all the time because they're, they're like, well, I want to have access to as much money as I possibly can in the first year. And I say, well, that's that's great. And we're not going to go into the reasons why you should or shouldn't do that. But that's not thinking long term. And you're not capitalizing for the sake of building up your banking system. And a lot of people, the, the reason they want this is they don't want to have the lack of liquidity in the first year. But in any business endeavor, you're going to put capital in that you do not have liquidity for that yes. business endeavor. And that's where the EVA comes in, the economic value add, so that you're trying to say this cost of capital is a long range thing that I'm doing that's going to pay off later on. And so don't think of the lack of liquidity as being a bad thing. That's what every successful business has, where if you're starting a restaurant, you know, you're going to have to have all the equipment, all the all the uh, certifications uh, by the health department and all that's going to be cost. You're going to have to have computers. You're going to have to have, you know, uh, marketing to to start your business, so on and so forth. And all that's lack of liquidity. So just think of it as being another business. When I talk to business owners, they, when I start to talk to them like that, I said, this is just another business you're starting. And they, and they get that lack of liquidity then. I think that's, a perfect concept right here. Just because if you are thinking long-term and not being afraid to capitalize, you are, you are being prudent. So the opposite that you just described is the person who says, I need max liquidity right away. And I need to jump right to the investing. And it's almost like, well, if I save that's a, Oh, by the way, it's on the side, but I'm really not saving for the purpose of capitalizing anything for the future. I'm really just saving for the cursory check the box I saved. Now let me move that money straight from savings right into investing because investing is really what is exciting. And that's the thing that I really want to be doing. The problem there is that's not thinking long-term. That's thinking about what's most immediate and it is not considering capitalizing well. And so I think anyone listening to this could say, look, I don't even need to be thinking about the investment process right now. I just need to be thinking about how do I capitalize? You first need to capitalize your banking system so that you have capital to work with. So <clears throat> Bruce, I love that you brought those up here. They're in the back of my mind, but I, I love that you just brought them straight out in the open. So then um, he talks about a book, Paper Money by Adam Smith, who says this, a banker cannot make a loan unless he has a deposit. So what he's saying there is you can't provide a loan with which that person who borrowed the money from the bank will now pay interest back to the bank, which is the profitability to the bank. That's where the bank is making its money is on interest, one of the primary ways. So you can't do that unless you have a deposit. So then he see, says, it seems a little silly to state that so baldly, but if three college educated Americans in 10 don't know that we have to import oil, I don't feel so bad about saying something bald. Banks do not lend their money. They lend the money somebody else has left there. So then he talks about um, 
when you start up a bank, you have to put in some capital, then you get deposits, then you lend the deposits. In a proper bank, these three items bear prudent relation to each other. And then he takes a quite a while. Nelson really unpacks this whole idea. He said, if you are a little country bank with a capital of 100,000, it would be very imprudent of you to loan Brazil 50 million. So you have to have a balance in the ratio of what you're lending out to what capital you have held within your bank. And so the prerequisite or the price that you have to pay in order to be profitable and making big loans is to have large capital deposits inside of your bank. So um, Bruce, I would love to just kind of unpack that that example where he talks about the first national bank of Midland, but is there anything else that you'd like to um, just talk about that, that relationship and how it applies to us before we get there? Well, if people, people often wonder, you know, how banks make money and especially because there are, there are uh, failures to pay loans back. That's all figured into the actuarial calculations. So, and that's why also why they, for really large loans, they're going to run your credit. And that's why credit card companies run your credit and they will actually give you an interest rate commensurate with your credit, or they will have terms and conditions that if you miss, if you miss a payment, they will actually um, jack up your interest that you have to pay. So if a person thinks about the fact that if they borrow a thousand dollars from a credit card company and they're paying it's and they're they're a poor credit person they're paying 29.99 percent then that means in the let's just round to 30 um that means they're paying 300 dollars back to the the lending institution the bank so now the risk to the bank is only 700 dollars so they do it the next year, and now they paid another $300. So now the risk to the bank is only uh, $400. And so now, if they do not pay at all, the bank loses $400. Well, they've already figured out in their total business model that if they make enough interest from other people, they can overcome that loss of $400 in that particular situation. So they're constantly massaging interest rates to do two things. One, to hedge against people that won't, that do not pay back the loan. And two, to keep them low enough that people would actually use the lending of that particular bank. And so that is where the capitalistic invisible hand of the economy comes in. And that's what you're going to see right now. If we're in uh, the end of 20, uh, 2022, where there has been massive inflation because we did have years and years of, of low lending. So people just said, okay, I'm just going to grab a bunch of money and go do things with it. That caused inflation. And now the central banks are saying the only way to curb inflation now is to raise the interest rates so people are not as likely to borrow that money. And so this is the boom and bust cycle that the Austrians have always talked about. And it is caused by the central banks that are that are actually supplying money to the smaller commercial banks and frankly, the larger commercial banks are part of the, the, the Federal Reserve System. So it's this constant balance of the interest rates that determines whether Americans want to borrow money or not. And that is that invisible hand that keeps, hopefully keeps everything in check. It's also <clears throat> this big piece of how banks are making their money. And so they're balancing how the volume of loans with the amount of interest or the rate of interest that they're charging and the banks are maintaining profitability through that. So let's talk about um, this example that Nelson unpacks here in, um, in this chapter. And he's really talking about why you need this balance between 
capital that you're funding your banking system with, and then deposits and lending. He talks about this first national bank of Midland, Texas in September of 1983. So um, he said that at the time they had a loan portfolio of 1.5 billion and 26% of those, so about a quarter of those loans were non-performing, meaning they were not being paid back. So this is Bruce, you just had mentioned often there will be some loans that are maybe higher risk and that the bank knows that are not going to be paid back. But 26% is a very high percentage of not of non-performing loans. So what happened was, <clears throat> he said, when this sort of thing happens, someone has to support the situation, which is normally the function of the stockholders. But the because of losses of stockholder equity that were 87% of its value. So the stockholder's equity lost 87% of its value down from 1.5 billion down to 12 million. What happened is that he said, if you have 12 million in capital, that's all you have in capital because of stockholder equity. And then he said, you have 1.5 billion in loans. That's a shaky bank. That's a bank that everyone is saying, I'm not sure that I can trust in this bank. The problem was then um, the public found out. And then when they did, First National Bank um, deposits decreased by 500 million. So what, what was happening is the customers of the bank were saying, I'm not sure I can trust this bank to hold my capital and preserve it well that I can put my money in and I can get my money back out when I want it. This bank seems unstable. They're going underwater tremendously. I don't want to use this bank for my deposits anymore. And so now they're decreasing deposits by 500 million. So they're going from, um, I think they're at now 12 million in stockholder equity down by, anyway, they're, they're, they're really going in a bad direction. Then what happened was that, this is the part that I feel relates most prudently to being your own banker using infinite banking. He talks about then the multiplier effect. What was really happening? Oh, well, actually, I'm going to skip over that for a second. What he ended up saying is it came out later that the the non-performing loans were all made primarily to CEOs, mm. and they were made the, because the, the pe CEOs, the, the people on the bank board. Yes. So yes. the people who should have been making good decisions for the depositors and for the bank as a whole and for its long-term sustainability, they were taking loans to invest in oil, um, specifically a, yes, they were investing in the oil business. They thought they were going to really make a lot of money, but they neglected to repay the loans. So I think that they had also mentioned there had just been a big energy crisis just a while before that. So the oil business then righted itself, returned back to normal, and the people who had borrowed the money lost both their oil business and their banking business. The point of all of this is that if you are running your infinite banking system and you are capitalizing, first, don't be afraid to capitalize. Put the money in first. Then you're going to have to continue making premium payments and making deposits. Then if you're going to use that capital for loans, pay them back. Now, so you don't have to pay them back. They're going to charge you interest. They're going to continue to accrue the interest. And we say, yes, you have flexibility in the terms of you can pay back how you want, when you want, how much you want at a time. You can pay all in one lump sum or not. But the point is, if you don't pay back your loans, you're going to have a failing system. If you take out maximum loans, run up the interest, you're going to be in a situation where your infinite banking system is going to collapse. If you're just thinking about how can you put money in and then use it and not be a good, honest banker and pay back those loans, you are going to be in a, a bad position. And so I think the, the real point of this particular chapter is saying that you need to, even if you are the CEO of your own banking system, you're not just using it as a um, withdrawal, a slot machine, a vending machine where the money's coming out and you're saying, oh, I have this money in here. I'm going to go use it for all these things. You really need to be in a position of having a plan to repay and then actually fulfilling and following through and repaying those loans. Yeah, it's, it's, it's simply to be an honest banker. And yes, there's flexibility. And yes, you need a place for windfall, which our um, podcast with David Stearns um, was one of the greatest windfalls when Nelson graduated from the earth and left his death benefits to, to his children. Um, but the fact of the matter is you need to have 
a plan to pay back the loans or, or your system is just going to collapse. And Nelson wanted, that's why the beginning of the book, Nelson, Nelson's book is about the human condition and, and people not, you know, necessarily doing what's in their best interests all the time. And there's a variety of reasons for that. So he's constantly reminding people that you need to be an honest banker. And that's what it, that is what it comes down to. And remember, every time you pay back, then that's just more capital that you have to use in the future. It's the same, it's the same way if you take a home equity line of credit, which Nelson says you could use, you could do infinite banking with a home equity line of credit. Every time you pay back, it's just more capital that you have to use in the future. So yes, he was very adamant about that. And th that is the reason why he talks about First National uh, Bank. And that was in 1983, there was massive inflation, even worse inflation that we're, that we're experiencing right now in 2022. And so these oil companies were actually borrowing money to drill. But then, because I grew up in this era, <clears throat> we had times now, People didn't have enough money because of inflation to spend on travel. And so the, the cost of oil went down. And so even though this is what the EVA comes in again, we were talking about, they were borrowing at a high rate, but then they weren't getting, they weren't getting the reaping the benefits of selling the oil to make it profitable. So they weren't paying back their, their uh, capital and all the, all the oil people that were on the board were just continue to lend it out, even though they weren't getting repayments. And that's why they got such a shaky situation. You know, this really comes down to, again, personal responsibility, because mm -hmm. if you are going to run an infinite banking system, you need to be in a position of <clears throat> making wise investment decisions, not um, speculative ones or um, gambling with those investment with those loans that you're taking out you really want to be in a position that you are being a prudent investor that you're doing your due diligence on your investments that you know what you're doing and that you're investing well because when you invest well then you will be able to have that profitability to profitability to repay the loans and be able to maintain your banking system for a long time now we're not saying that you can never use policy loans for um, going on a vacation or remodeling your house. I mean, there are definitely times that because you have access to capital, you can use it for things that would be considered more of an expense as well, not just an investment. But you need to be in a position where you're not. Uh, I think redlining maybe is a a word I've overused in a couple of other situations. But if you're just say say for instance your your cash flow in your life, you is, I don't know, $100,000 per year. That's the maximum dollars that you're not spending. You're saving that over in, into an infinite, infinite banking system. And now you take a policy loan, you have no extra cash available to be able to repay a policy loan. You don't want to be in that position. You really want to be able to have some additional cushion of cash flow, dollars that you're making that you're not spending, that is not necessarily being deposit straight into your infinite banking system, you want to have something that's additional, that's available to repay those loans if you're taking them out for things that are expenses like buying cars or um, again, home remodels, weddings, vacations, things like that. That's just wise thinking. You want to make sure that you don't just have enough cash to pay your policy premiums. You also want enough cash to repay policy loans. Bruce, he does bring up fractional reserve um, banking. And I want to point this out because you had mentioned fractional reserve banking before, but this is very interesting um, that if you're not very familiar with fractional reserve banking, I would dig into it a little bit more. But generally what happens is if the bank has $1 in deposits, they can loan out 10. And that's the way the fractional reserve banking works. And so if there's on deposits a thousand, they can lend out 10,000 as a result of that. And what Nelson says, I love how he just says it in black and white terms. He says he thinks that it's really the largest con game um, out there. And that what is happening is that it's predicated on the theory that not everyone will withdraw all their money all at once. And that's absolutely true. Because if if you were in a position where you took 
$10,000 in deposits, you can now lend out 10,000 and you have those 10,000 lent out. You don't have the 1,000 to be able to give back to all the, the depositors if they all asked for their money at once. And um, <clears throat> it is what our banking system uses to be able to accelerate or exponentially increase their profitability. But at the same time, we need to recognize that, um, that it also makes it more unstable, especially in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Bruce, there's another very interesting concept that he brings up at the end here, and that's cogeneration. Um, I have a few thoughts on that, but let's go ahead and share just what he says. And then let's talk about how that applies to our infinite banking policies. So <clears throat> he talks about cogeneration and he unpacks this idea where he said, if you were going to use, if you were going to um, have a sawmill or a paper mill and you're taking lumber and turning it into, or you're taking trees, whole trees, and you're turning it into either paper or into lumber that people can use for building projects, you're gonna have some byproducts, some waste. And that's going to be things like the um, bark of the trees and all mm -hmm. the sawdust. And usually you would think of that as just waste products. But he said, what happens is you can actually take those waste products and you can burn them, which creates a fuel. And if you create enough fuel that can generate electricity or enough heat that creates electricity, you can actually use the electricity from burning your waste products to generate to run your entire power plant. So he's saying you can make a self-sustaining system by using what most people would just throw away, burning that, creating electricity for your plant. And then he says, you can, in fact, if you create more energy than what your uh, plant needs to be productive and to function, you can sell that energy into the General energy. public. Yeah, yeah, to the to the public through the um, regular energy grid. And he said, but instead of, you know, making all your own power lines to individual people's houses to sell your energy to them, it would make much more sense to just sell the energy to the power company, tap into their system and let them distribute the additional energy that you've created. So he talks about that being co-generation. And I think there's probably multiple applications for what that means for infinite banking. But uh, Bruce, I'd love your thoughts on that first before I share mine. Yeah. So what he's, the way it works in infinite banking, then it's like, if you do not have the need to borrow against your policy, um, because you have everything you, you're financing through it, you know, the investments that you're, you're doing, well, you could then lend the money to somebody else that needs money. Um, and so a great example is hard money lending in real estate. You know, people will say, okay, um, I'm under current, I'm borrowing at 5% and I'll give you this money and I'm just going to lend it to you at 12%. And so I'm truly becoming a bank, not just becoming my own bank, but becoming a bank that I'm selling to loans to the general public, just like if you're selling the electricity back to the power grid for them then to sell it to somebody else. So that's the basic concept of this as far as your own infinite banking system. I think, um, could it be possible as well, just in um, thinking this through and talking with Lucas yesterday, that if you're co-generating as well, it could also mean that if you're creating capital <clears throat> by putting it into your infinite banking system and that's growing with interest and dividends and then you borrow against it and you put it into a prudent wise investment that you're also generating capital in that second investment so you're you're multitasking you're earning money in two places at the same time i mean i think that there could be application where that could that co-generation could mean you're also generating capital in two places at the same time and you want more that you're producing from your investments that's more than sufficient to repay your loans. I mean, I think there's um, a world, there's a, a application, I think, that could possibly relate to that concept as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I was just saying that most people get the concept of the financing for themselves, using it for investments for themselves. Mm -hmm. But the, the third one that is really close to this is that you have excess 
money, just like they had excess electricity that you could then just say, well, I'm just going to lend this to use it however you want to use it. And then because you're, you're not monitoring that investment, you're just monitoring the payback of that. So that's how it's a little different between the other two. I think also, I mean, that's a really good connection over to the idea of using it for family banking. So if you have your own infinite banking system, maybe it's a policy on your life and maybe your son or your granddaughter has a business idea or some reason, maybe they want to go to college, perhaps they could ask for a policy loan from your banking system. And if they have a plan then to repay that loan at interest, that may be a wise, um, loan for you as your own banker to grant that loan. So it could be within your own family. It could be outside of your own family. It could be in your investor circles as well, but absolutely there are ways to be able to use that capital and lend it for the purpose of profitability beyond your own needs. Yeah. So I can give you an example. So my father borrowed against his cash value and his policy to buy a rental property And then my sister, who hadn't built up enough capital for her own down payment for her own home yet, was renting from my father. And then the rental payments, insurance companies allow this, the rental payments were not going directly back to my father. They were going directly to the insurance company to pay off the loan. So, So a lot of people don't know that, that you can actually have a third party that can actually pay into somebody's um, life insurance policy to pay the loan back. We have this with several of our clients who allow their children or grandchildren to borrow from the family bank and do the same thing. They borrow from it to purchase a car. And then that money comes from the grandchild's bank and it goes directly to the insurance company to pay the loan back. I think this is just a profound exercise in, imagination here again, because if you realize that by capitalizing your own banking system and by gaining capital, by having deposits, by paying your premiums, that is the um, preface. It's the, it's the, um, it's the key. It's the prerequisite that allows your ability then to lend out capital. And if you have unlimited ability to lend out capital, then why wouldn't you want to begin by capitalizing and putting deposits in by paying your premiums? So I think it's the the applications, the ways that you can use it are far beyond what we normally think of in our everyday financial lives. But if you can imagine that there are so many other ways that you could lend out capital and have that those loans repaid that would add to your profitability in your banking system, then the ticket to being able to do that, the admission price is paying premiums and originally capitalizing that policy. So um, I think this was a fantastic, just a a demonstration of why you don't want to over leverage your policy, why you don't want to loan out or borrow against 100% of your capital and and never repay your loans. That would be a very imprudent, unwise decision. Uh, And then really just talking about why it's really important to be in a position that you are capitalizing and and having those deposits. Bruce, is there anything else that you wanted to bring in from the next chapter? And we also have a question here in the comments that we can address as well. Uh, No, I think we're, I think we're just overlapping if we go into the next chapter right now. So yeah, we have a chat, we have a question on YouTube about creating payment schedules for repayment of policy loans. Uh, What, what programs like Excel do you find most useful? Um, so we actually help our clients. I use a simple app app that produces amortization schedules. So we'll have a discussion. Um, this just happened again last week where somebody wanted to borrow $25,000 to do a, a bathroom remodel in their home in Los Angeles. And then we discuss through their financial picture um, their cash flow, what they would like to be able to pay back, and what was the 
time period they would like to pay back. And they said they would like to pay it back in six years. So we did a six-year amortization schedule right at the 5% mark that the insurance company was charging them. Now, I know in the book, Nelson often says, well, you ought to charge yourself 10% and you know, make that extra 5% because that 5% is going to the insurance company. The extra 5% is going back in your system. And I've talked to Nelson about this, and it's a little harder to do it since Nelson wrote the book in, in 2000. It was a lot easier to overfund PUAs, but because of the change in the laws of 7702 and the MAC limits uh, have changed since then, it's harder for insurance companies to, be, to allow people to do that. It's not impossible, but it's harder. So we just tell people, um, you know, if, if, you haven't, if you haven't fully funded your PUAs, you can do that. But you're really, all you're doing is buying more PUAs. That's what everybody has to understand what Nelson was talking about. You weren't saving more money just for the sake of saving. You were actually purchasing more PUAs. And so they answer- on that note, if you've already paid your full base premium and your full PUAs, Every single year, there's no extra there's no room. space to put any more in than just Correct. what the interest that the insurance company charges. Correct. So this person that asked us on YouTube, we use a simple app, determine the amortization schedule, determine what it works into the to the cash flow, and then we just set up a, a draft uh, from the person's bank, just like you would if you set up a car, you know, a car payment. We would just draft right out of your your bank. And, you know, some people I understand might have multiple loans out there and so on and so forth. Um, Most insurance companies will not allow you to have separate drafts for each loan. So in other words, if you started out with a $400 payment and you took another one and you wanted to make another $600 payment, you can't have a $400 payment on the fifth of the month and another $600 payment on the 15th of the month. You just have to do a thousand dollar payment at one time. So I think that's what the this particular listener was asking. How do we track those? Um, we put it on the, once we, dis, we determine the amortization schedule and then we set up the ACH, we put it on the client to actually track it. Although we're, re, you know, we're reviewing every year. We, we have an open policy. If somebody wants to ask us the question, I got two text messages yesterday from clients asking me about loans and what they could do to actually inc- one in one case to increase the payment and another case they wanted to decrease the payment probably because Christmas time and cash flow was a little little less and then I had one oh I forgot about this one I had one that said he was expecting his Christmas bonus before the end of the year and he was going to use it to pay off his loan, but he didn't get it. So he's going to have to wait till it's not going to come till January now. So then we're going to pay it off of there. So we do help, but we do expect this is your system. Okay. So you've got to take some responsibility of tracking your own system and, you know, Excel spreadsheets are great for that, but we will help you with the amortization schedules. I think also uh, just a helpful comment on that would be that you want to track your full balance of loans and the full payment of loans. I mean, you're probably not going to be wise to take out a new loan every month. You're going to want to use larger chunks of loans all at once instead of taking a lot of small, tiny loans. That's going to be a lot of work to manage for you. Yeah. And this is something else that people have gotten and they've misunderstood what I believe they misunderstood what Nelson was asking or telling. He was talking about running your entire cash flow through your system. You can't, insurance companies don't even allow you to do that until you get up to a certain net worth because they have a multiplier on your income that squelches how much death benefit you can get. So you can only get so much death benefit on your cash flow, or you can get whatever your net worth is, whichever is higher. Well, you can't run all your income through it until you build up your net worth to be higher than the multiplier of your cash flow. And so people misinterpret that like, well, if I run it all through, I'm going to have to be borrowing every month to use for my normal expenses. 
that's not why Nelson said that. Nelson was saying that so you can get as much capital in there as possible. He wasn't saying that you should be funding your lifestyle out of it every month. Now you can still, he's not saying you shouldn't fund your lifestyle out of it. He's just saying you shouldn't fund it out of it every month. So you might do it every six months. In other words, you borrow against it every six months, put it into your checking account to run your life for six months and then repeat that every six months because the put and take, it's, it's, a, it's an administrative nightmare for not only you, but for the insurance companies. And the insurance companies, remember, you are a part owner of the insurance company. So you're trying to keep the administration costs of the insurance companies down because you want to benefit from the higher profitability in the form of higher dividends. So it's not that that big of a, a reach to think that you want to keep the administrative costs down for the insurance company. Do you have another question? Rachel, I think Sorry, you're muted. I was muted. Yeah. Um, there yeah. was another question uh, from Joseph. He said, do you have any guidance on what risk premium to charge? Do you know what he's talking about? Uh, I'm not, unless he's talking about risk. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's talking about, unless he's talking about like risk premium to if you're lending the money out to somebody else. Probably. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that, no, I don't have any guidelines on that. Um, you know, even the actuaries, actuaries have, you know, a lot of numbers when they determine, but they still miss all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I wouldn't lend out, I wouldn't lend out to somebody that you don't know fairly well, or, or know if there's a platform for, for hard money lending that is screening these people. Um, yes. And if you are the screening them on your own, you're going to want a due diligence process to be able to um, consider and qualify the person and look at their qualifications, look at their income, look at their expenses, understand the investment that they're making so that you know um, whether you would make that investment or not, <clears throat> whether this person has a history of repaying loans. So there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a, a word that I'm thinking of here, but to really determine whether that's a prudent loan to make. And certainly you could charge additional beyond what the policy uh, interest is that would be paid to yourself directly, especially for uh, a loan that would be more high risk, but I'm not encouraging high risk loans. Yeah, uh, and then uh, here's another question. JJ uh, Joyce, who's asking about the amortization schedules, says, would you suggest a quarterly or a month um, monthly or six month policy loan? Listen, I. I don't think it should be any less than a six month policy loan. I can't, I can't get into the reasons why, right? I can get into the reasons why, but I can't explain it. It, it takes way too long, but number one, it's about the administration costs from the company, but it's also about your administration costs. I mean, if you're spending all this time trying to rectify, you know, your books about, okay, this is a policy loan I'm paying back. Okay. Now uh, next month I got to get one. But the insurance company is always, depending, and I don't know, JJ, if you're paying monthly or quarterly or semi-annually or annually, uh, the insurance companies, once you make a payment, it goes through a process where there's a hold on that payment for anywhere between 10 and 20 days. And so you're going to make that payment. You're certainly not going to, you're certainly not going to want to do this monthly because they put a hold on it. And then it shows your loan value going down it because what they're doing is they're collateralizing your cash value in case you don't make your premium payment. Okay. So it's just an administrative nightmare. So I would say the bare minimum is not to take any policy loans to fund your normal everyday expenses, no more than every six months. You might even consider once a year. And I know what happens here. People's like, yeah, but if I take it and I just set it in there, then I'm paying interest. But that's okay because you've capitalized and you're making interest and dividends on that also. And yes, it might cost you, the cost of capital might be, after you're paying the loan back, it might be 3% cost of capital. But is that 3% worth the administrative cost that you have? Probably. You know, so That's I would a really good point, Bruce. I think so many times our world 
in the name of making things simpler has made things so complicated that we're all running around frazzled and ragged sometimes trying to do all the things that are supposed to supposedly for our convenience. And so I think, um, yeah, this isn't really about convenience. It's more, or it's not just about um, saving the exact amount of dollars. It's really about making a system that's going to be sustainable and not make you go crazy. I mean, this is not meant yeah. to be so complicated that you're having to track it on multiple lines of a spreadsheet and and a lot of loans and where you are in all of those loans. And you should you should be um, simplifying the system as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I would I would focus more on capitalizing the system and using it for big ticket items, uh, getting rid of fat financing. I would also uh, focus on investments, but for your everyday, you know, electric bill, so on and so forth. I just think there's more in life to be to do, and you can actually free up your creativity to actually make more money in other aspects than to try to save that you know, a little bit of interest that you're paying the insurance company. And remember, it's the net interest because you're still making money from the insurance company. It's the net that you're making, the cost of capital, as we talked about earlier in the podcast. Absolutely. Hold on. Excuse me. This has been a great conversation. Thank you for everyone who's chimed in. Thank you for everyone who's listened live. Go ahead and give the um, this episode just a like if you're listening on YouTube, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. Um, we'd love to hear your questions even after the show. So if you have questions, you can pop those into the comments or you can email us at hello at themoneyadvantage.com. You can also... Um, subscribe to our channel. If you want more content like this, we also, if you're listening live right now, we also have this available later on podcast. So you can go to iTunes. Um, I think it's called Apple podcast now, Stitcher, um, Spotify, all the places you can get podcasts and we're there as well. Thank you so much for being a listener, a regular listener. And um, we just really appreciate you digging into finding answers and being more knowledgeable and skillful in d developing your own infinite banking system. So we are, we're really thankful for you as our listeners. Thank you, Bruce, for joining me almost every week. I know we've had a few weeks that we've missed due to the, you know, holidays and um, stuff lately, but this has been really fun um, continuing to unpack this book. So we're going to keep going through becoming your own banker. We may have some additional conversation thrown in here and there. Um, but we're going to continue on with this book. And if you are interested in implementing this in your own life, you can go to themoneyadvantage.com. You can book a conversation right now with an advisor who's going to be able to look at your entire financial picture, ask you questions about your goals, really see where you're at and where you want to go and figure out what the best, most prudent way for you to begin or to add to your family banking system is right now. So we would encourage you to do that. And it's a great time to begin thinking about how to capitalize and think long-term for the future. So thank you for being with us today. In closing, please remember success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd and build a life and business you love. We'll see you next time.